Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the question and answer session with the current students, which is held as a part of the Experience Grad York today. My name is Yuko Sorano, and I'm the manager of external scholarships and graduate awards at the Faculty of Graduate Studies, York University. Um, I'll be moderating the session today, joined by three grad students, current students, um, who I'll introduce in a moment. I begin this session with land acknowledgement. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, the land acknowledgement is a way for us to recognize the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples of Canada. Uh, although we're not gathering in a traditional in-person format, it is just as important to begin the session with the land in which York is, um, to acknowledge the land um, in which York University is situated. York University recognized that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been uh, caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the First Nation. This territory is subject to, of the dish with one spoon, um, one spoon belt, belt covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. So you may have had a chance to attend some of the experience grad um, sessions today. Uh, today was the first day of the four day event. Uh, but if you haven't, we encourage you to take advantage, advantage of this week's series of sessions to learn about uh, your grad studies. So of the various sessions that are happening this week, what's unique about uh, this panel is that this is the way really you get to hear firsthand perspectives and experiences of the current students at the university. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the three students who kindly agreed to be here today. So first is Cameron Butler, a doctoral student in social anthropology. Uh, Next, uh, Sammy John Johnson, a uh, doctoral student in critical disability studies. And uh, Molly Hu, master's student in chemistry. So as you can see, uh, these, these students study in very different disciplines. So our hope is that the panel can offer diverse perspectives. Uh, so let me describe the format. Um, so we'll ask students to introduce themselves first. And after that, so we have a series of questions that we have received from those who, re who registered for this event in advance. So we'll start with those questions. But those of you who are also in the audience can um, well, welcome to put in questions in the question and the uh, answer that box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. Um, and we'll be able to direct them to the panel as well. So we may not be able to um, cover every single question, but uh, we uh, aim to cover a wide range of questions that the students, uh, or prospective students are interested in learning about uh, being a grad student at York University. Okay, so um, can I first ask uh, each of you on the panel to introduce yourself uh, with perhaps a brief description of your area of study or research topic. Um, so um, let's start with Cameron, you. Hi, thanks, Iko. Uh, so my name is Cameron Butler. I'm a, a third year PhD student in the Department of Social Anthropology here at York. Um, my res for my research, I'm looking at global phosphorus, uh, the economy of global phosphorus um, and agriculture and mining and, and looking at the ways in which food production um, kind of relates with uh, mineral, uh, mineral ex extraction uh, and mining. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sami, next. Hi there, my name is Sami Jo. I'm also in my third year of my PhD in the Critical Disability Studies program, which is under the School of Health Policy Management. Um, and my work lately is focusing on community organizing, knowledge production, and exclusion of deaf and disability communities from higher education. Thank you. Uh, Molly, and I know Molly, you are guest on campus today, so you're joining from your lab. Thank you for joining. Yes, yes. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Molly, and I'm in my fourth year currently in my PhD in chemical biology. So um, I study uh, essentially DNA in libraries and its applications. And so essentially it's a tool for early drug discovery. 
and we're just trying to um, increase the applications of it and also to uh, investigate a couple of interesting chemistries on it. Great, great, thank you. Okay, so for the first question, which we'll ask to all of you is what inspired your decision to pursue a master's or doctoral degree? So I think those of you who are master's and doctoral, if you can mention both, um, why you decided to pursue a graduate degree, the master's degree first, uh, first of all, and then why you continue on to, uh, to, to the doctoral level. Um, so I guess I'll start uh, with Sami, it's okay. Sure. So I, I also did my MA in the same program at York. Um, it's, I think I did my MA because I like school. I like studying, I like school. And um, in my, where I did my undergrad at the University of Alberta, they did not have a disability studies program. So I was really excited that um, York has that program at a graduate level. Um, and then I came back to do my PhD again for the same reasons, because I like school and I thought it would be fun. It is fun, but it is also really hard <laughs> um, to focus on my research further. Yeah. Okay, uh, Molly. Um, so I also started like Sammy um, in the last year's year as well. And honestly, just I really liked the research that I was doing, and I really liked um, the different things that we were able to learn and investigate. And so I want to continue on, and this is why I transferred to my PhD here. Okay, uh, great. Um, Cameron. Yeah, so I also similarly started my master's um, because, you know, in my undergrad, there were a lot of kind of courses I was taking that I was really excited about and really wanted to kind of learn more. Um, and so jumped into a master's as a, as a way of kind of continuing to give myself the space to, to do kind of exploring things that I was interested in. <clears throat> um, and then as I then was thinking about doctoral program, um, that was really where I was both seeing that I was really enjoying research and really enjoying that process of kind of that, you know, like discovering and making, making claims and, and really kind of putting out um, thoughts and, and new ideas. Um, while also trying to think about seeing academia as a potential career path, as the possibility of, of becoming a professor um, with as much of the awareness that it is a, an incredibly difficult thing to do and uh, a very um, less than stellar job market. Um, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, great, thank you. Okay, um, so um, the next question is why did you choose York University? I think Sammy, you said a little bit about that, but you know, if you had any other reasons um, why um, you wanted to join York University, um, it is true that the critical disability study is a fairly unique program that many universities don't have at the grad level. Um, so yeah, if you can mention like what attracted you to the critical disability program, um, also if there are any reasons, other reasons why you thought York could be a place for you. Sure. Um, yeah, so mostly it's because the, that York has this program. I hadn't even heard of York before, so I'm from Edmonton. Um, I had started taking a couple of uh, courses in women's and gender studies that are focused on the body and thinking about disability as a socio-political label and experience and as well as identity. And then um, I wanted to study it further and a professor just told me, hey, York has this program. And I was I remember asking like, did you just say Yale? And they were like, no, York. So <laughs> the first time I heard about York um, and I wanted to take critical disability studies because uh, both of my parents are deaf. And now that I'm doing my PhD, I'm thinking more about where there is and is not space for um, deaf studies, deaf scholars, deaf academics, deaf students at York University. So that's been um, kind of a bit of a journey in um, the last couple, the last little bit in my studies, but yeah, York and having done my master's here, I knew I really loved all the professors in the program. So it was kind of easier to stay. All right, okay, great, thank you. Um, Cameron, can I ask you why you chose York University? So you're in social anthropology, so I, I, I imagine there are other programs that you thought about um, joining as well. Yeah, so for, so my, I did my master's in environmental studies here at York. So I <coughs> kind of I also did I did my undergrad at McGill in um, bioresource engineering. So I've weaved through a lot of different uh, departments and disciplines, um, but I, I chose York for my master's. Um, in part because the work that I was starting to do 
was on queer ecology and I was reading a lot of texts and one of the, you know, the people who had written an edited volume on it was this uh, professor, Katrina Sanderlands, and I found out she was at York. Um, and I was like, I want to work with her. <coughs> um, and, you know, and I looked more at the environmental studies program and it's a really amazing one that, that gives you a lot of space to do a really wide range of kind of research and different kinds of work. Um, and so that was very much like for my master's, I was like, York is where I'm going. I'm doing the environmental studies program, that's it. <coughs> um, and then when it came to the PhD, it was at a time where I was figuring out what discipline I wanted to go into. Did I want to stay in environmental studies? Did I want to move into geography? Did I move, want to move into anthropology? Um, because my research was kind of engaging with people in a lot of different disciplines. And so I was really struggling to figure out where, where I fit. Um, <coughs> And so part of it was that there were professors at, in the anthropology department at York that I was really close with and really wanted to work with. Um, but it was a time where I did apply to a lot of schools in Canada and the States. And, and so did my partner, because we were both, both at our master's and both applying for PhDs. Um, and one of the things that came out, it was also just deciding kind of the life circumstances of, you know, what were the schools that we both got into? what would our life look like in each kind of city, what was feasible for us. Um, and so there was, you know, the things about like the, the TA ships at York and the kind of funding packages that we have and the, like the, the, the funds that we get through the union were, you know, just really um, enticing um, mm -hmm. and, and, and are, are just really, really great. Um, and also just having that kind of fit with people here. So it was a, <clears throat> It was a more complicated decision for the doctorate because it is, you know, a four, five, six year commitment to kind of say, this is where I'm going to be. And these are the people that I'm going to learn from to be sort of be trained into being, you know, an, a professional in, in academia. And so it, it is a, it was a harder thing that was a, a lot more of kind of balancing a lot of different things about interests and in, in our respective kind of lives. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think it's a really, you know, you, you raise a really good point. I think compared to, you know, most of the undergraduate students, you know, the graduate students have, you know, varying life circumstances as well that also factor in a decision as well. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, Molly, can I also ask you why you chose York University? Did you, first of all, did you undergrad at York uh, or did you choose um, some, or did you come to York from somewhere else? Uh, so I actually came from York from somewhere else. Um, I originally actually wasn't sure what I wanted to do, and when I was considering grad school, I went through a lot of the things that, um, like, I went through the professor's profiles and, like, looked at their research and just, like, um, someone at York, the person I'm currently working with, his research just really sparked my interest because I've always been really interested in pharmaceutical development and drug discovery and just based on what he was researching, it just sounded like it was such an efficient way to find new drugs. And so this is something that I really wanted to like get on, get into and like just work on that. And I'm like very thankful that he did accept me and like I'm here now. Um, but on top of that, uh, the other reason why I chose York is because for one, I really wanted to be in Toronto. Toronto is a great city. And I also really love the fact that York itself was kind of like a little mini city inside of Toronto. Like there's it's very like a close-knit um, community I feel that I can like really get to know the other grad students and so like personally for me I felt like it was the best decision for me and of course um, like Cameron said um, there was a lot, also a lot of scholarships and support as well that was at York University and I thought that that was like a better choice for me and so um, I ended up coming here for my master's and then for my doctoral degree um, it's kind of the same idea I kind of got a bit more involved on campus as well and I really made I feel like I, this place has really like made me feel at home. And so that's why I decided to stay for my doctoral degree. And also um, I really loved the research that I was doing and I wanted to continue doing that. And that is why um, I chose York for both my master's and doctoral. Okay, oh, great, thank you. So I guess um, I guess many of you mentioned that so working with a particular supervisor was also one factor as well. And then I think there'll be more questions coming about sort of the funding, financing your education piece as well. So good to hear that that also was a factor as well. 
Okay, so uh, the next question, which is a little bit related to the one that was just asked, but I'll ask this to Cameron. Um, how did you decide which program was right for you? And I think you chose, you mentioned that, you know, you came from sort of a, a biochemistry engineering kind of background to in environmental studies to social anthropology. Can you sort of describe a little bit about sort of the research trajectory that you, you took? Um, and, you know, when you're deciding on, uh, you know, um, choosing your program, um, who did you talk to or like any sort of process that you uh, you took to come to your decision? Yeah, it was, so I think, especially for the doctoral level, it was a, a complicated process because I knew the, the research project that I wanted to do and I knew the kind of questions that I wanted to be asking and pursuing, but I didn't necessarily have a clear idea of how I would go about answering them. <laughs> um, so I, for my research, research, I'm looking at the ways which, basically when it comes to agriculture, phosphorus is one of the key three elements for fertilizers, um, but it gets depleted. And so instead what happens is phosphate rockets mined and then transported, turned into fertilizer, put in fields. Um, but it's getting rapidly kind of used up or depleted in that like the few reserves that exist are being used up and they're ending up in the oceans and kind of lost. And so <clears throat> I want to look at kind of the globally, how is it that people, how is it that that movement happens and how is it that, that it's structured around kind of supporting the lives of like white settlers in Canada at the expense of, um, you know, migrant farm workers, people in um, the global south, all of these kinds of questions. <clears throat> but what I was really struggling with is kind of what are my research methods or how would I do a project on that? Um, and so that ended up being really the thing that was difficult because I, I did, I applied to both environmental studies and anthropology at York um, and was accepted to both. And so, you know, even once I decided that I was going to stay at York, I had to decide which program. And so it was a lot of talking with my master's supervisor, Kate, and, and my partner and friends and really getting a sense of what, what is the point of a PhD and, and what, what do they kind of open? And for me, um, I chose anthropology because it gave me a very clear disciplinary grounding and kind of set of methods that I could use and then also kind of bounce off of. But so for me, it was that question of not just the research I want to do, but really how to do it and what kind of research I want to wanted to learn to do, which kind of helped sort of guide that choice. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and then so the next uh, question that I want to ask uh, Molly and Sami um, is, and I, it might be, uh, you know, somewhat depending on the discipline or the degree that you took at undergrad and then sort of a connect, connection to your graduate studies, but did you find that your undergraduate degree prepare you for grad school um, and the program that you're in specifically? Or, or if you can add any other experience you had outside like after maybe perhaps after your bachelor's before your first graduate degree, um, if sort of, you know, your experience in the gra undergrad or after that helped you for graduate uh, degree program. Uh, Sami, can I ask you to respond first? Sure. Um, my undergrad was in women's and gender studies and um, I would say it prepared me fairly well for my master's. Um, I wasn't super overwhelmed with the writing. There was a lot of writing, especially in, um, in critical disability studies. Um, but uh, disability studies is very interdisciplinary. So even if you use a feminist lens, feminist theory, feminist writing, you could do your whole, probably your whole MRP and your PhD on that. That's not to say women's and gender studies includes disability all the time or in all cases, but but um, I really liked being in an interdisciplinary field. It makes it hard at times. I feel like I don't have grounding or footing. I'm, I'm always questioning where I'm coming from. But at the same time, I get to kind of draw in any sort of critical field that it, disability studies, I think that's important to disability studies. So, so I say it prepared me pretty well. I had really amazing professors in my undergrad as well, who, who I still stay in contact with. And I think that maybe that's important. If, if you like your undergrad and your program, you know, those professors are a really good um, place to start if you're thinking about going to grad school. That, that was a big help for me. Okay, great. Uh, what about you, Molly? Did you do the same chemistry field in your undergrad or maybe after your undergraduate degree? Yeah, so um, I had a bit of a more, I think, interesting career path because at first, when I first started university, you know, you're like, 17, 18 year old, you don't really know what you like. You don't really know what you want. 
And so a lot of the times, like you just have a limited perspective of what the paths are for you. And so when I first started, I actually was doing um, medical sciences and ethics. And then I realized pretty quickly that um, ethics was really hard. It was like kudos to you, Sammy, like, and also Cameron, like, I just, I know, like, it's, there's so much like things that I just cannot like get it, like be able to like, um, how do I say it? Express in terms of ethics. So like, I'm just like, it is not my field. But anyways, um, in terms of the science part, what I found was really interesting was when I first started medical sciences, I was like, okay, so this is cool. I like this part of it. But what I didn't like was the fact that most of the time it was like alphabet soup. It's like enzyme A, B, C causes Z and then it becomes E. And I'm like, okay, but what exactly is happening here? And so that really made me realize that throughout my degree, what I was really interested in was the actual mechanisms and everything that was behind what was happening. And that drew me into chemistry. And I actually transferred into chemistry my undergraduate. And um, once I finished my degree there, uh, I came to New York University for my grad school. And I felt that personally, that it actually prepared me quite well in some ways and not so well in others. And it's, when you're in your undergrad, most of it's like textbook, right? Like you're learning a lot of stuff from the textbook itself. You do have lab experiences and everything and you do like some hands-on stuff so that you can experience what it would be like to do your own research. But in grad school, um, I didn't expect this, but I grew so much as a person and as a researcher because there's so many things that you didn't think about that you still needed to like grow and develop. But grad school has taught me a lot of it. Um, like for instance, one of the biggest things is um, understanding that failure doesn't define you. That is like the biggest thing that I needed to learn like my first day like here. And a lot of the times your experiences are not going to work. And knowing that that just happens sometimes and knowing that like, you know, you just got to keep trying and just learning how to research itself is like something that undergrad tries to teach you, but I don't think you can really learn until you get here. Um, but yeah, I hope that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, no, and I think it happens. I mean, you know, often that in the camera, like you sort of switch to formal degrees too. So it often happens that, you know, we have a, a graduate students who just um, studied um something similar but different or completely different field um so yeah so i think your experience sort of you know is similar to and it might be you know similar to what many of the students or people in the audience are sort of you know seeing as well um so that sort of connects to the next question as well and then i want to um ask this to cameron and uh, sammy although I, I, well let me ask this question anyway first so how will uh, real world experience um help you or has helped you as a grad student and so like alternatively would you say that um you know like any sort of um relevant experience outside perhaps after undergrad or maybe during undergrad but outside of the university specifically prepared for sort of your graduate degree and i sort of say this because I, i'm not sure exactly sort of your trajectory but um a lot of graduate students at york have done um something else other than school between undergrad and graduate like some you know some people may have done like really like five years ten years more of professional experience coming back to um university uh, others may have done fairly straight you know from undergrad to graduate um so if you had any sort of gap in between but even if you didn't if you had had anything that's really not related to your undergraduate uh that sort of you know uh, helped you with the graduate degree um that'd be great so i guess cameron can i ask you to talk about a little bit of that sure yeah i so i spent six years doing my undergraduate degree and then took three years off between uh undergrad and, and my master's <laughs> Um, and I think, and in, in that time, I did uh, work that I'd wanted to do around student programming, around mental health, anti-oppression, substance use, uh, a lot of kind of like um, organizing student events, workshops, educational material, and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I think, I think that time wasn't something that may directly helps or didn't necessarily directly shape or inform how I've approached graduate studies, but it has, it did give me both space to kind of step back from academia and the kind of, you know, like going from high school to undergrad and this, you know, the constant like studying for, you know, 15 years straight. I think it was both helpful to kind of step away from that and have time to not do that, to do other things and then return to it. Um, 
and it also helped me both kind of I think be a bit older and a bit more mature upon entering graduate school and having a bit of a better sense of what kinds of you know boundaries to put up about work-life balance and how much do I like get involved in things or how, how do I like set these kinds of boundaries to not have it be my the entirety of my life um, but it also then gave me a lot of time to think about what I actually really wanted to do like why what that I actually did really want to do a master there was research that I really wanted to do and it, it helped me sort of really clarify what I wanted to do and and really ensure that I wasn't just sort of entering because I'd finished my master or because I'd finished undergrad and that's the next step. Um, it really gave me the time to kind of reflect on that. Yeah, good to know. Um, Sammy, what about you? So I went right from undergrad to my master's, but after my master's, I took two years off or almost two years off. Um, and I would agree with Cameron, like it was nice to have that space, but I, I, and when I had that space, I was like, hey, I do miss school. <laughs> so that's good to know, especially at times when uh, graduate school feels like overwhelming, like, no, oh, I have to remind myself, I do like this. <laughs> um, and also having those real world experiences. I think whatever it is, if you're working, if you're child caring, if you're doing arts, if you're doing activism, I think that there's a space, especially at York, to bring that in and use that as experience. Like that, that what we're learning in our literature is not everything and we need more, um, more. <laughs> so I think um, there's always a way, I mean, to, to bring in your real life experience into this academy, hopefully into what you're studying. Um, and also for me, it was really important to like, to make some community connections and to see like, not only what it's like, inside school, but what it's like outside school, because I went straight from my undergrad to my master's. Um, yeah, so it was helpful to have a break, I think, in all. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. Um, okay, so that that's great, uh, you know, to hear about all of sort of your decision making and the trajectory coming to the grad school. So next we next set of set of questions about your sort of student life. Um, so I guess the first question is, what has been the most memorable part of um, your um, graduate student journey so far? Um, can I ask that to Molly, perhaps? Sure. Um, so, oh my goodness. For one memorable moment, um, I can't say specifically, but I will say that um, many memorable moments that I have, particularly just with my own group, so with my own lab, um, before COVID, we used to celebrate our birthdays together, and it used to be the cutest thing, and it was just great to feel like so at home and so welcome in the community. Um, in terms of like academia, I think like the most memorable experience I've had so far while at York is um, so this past summer, I actually went on an internship at uh, GlaxoSmith Kline in the USA um, in order to engage in an internship uh, that's completely related to my field. And it was super awesome. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to go on it because of um, a scholarship that I was able to apply through York. So that was like a really awesome opportunity. And I learned a lot of really great uh, skills and also made a lot of great connections and networks for my field. So that was probably like two of the most memorable things <laughs> for me here. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, on the other hand, so um, as a graduate student, I'm sure that, you know, your sort of demand for study is fairly, um, you know, strong. And, and you know, um, so there's a question that we have from the audience about, like, the burnout and sort of balancing your studies with, you know, other things. So do you ever feel, and I think this question, I, I'll ask this to Molly again, and also to Sami too. Do you ever feel uh, a burnout? Um, how do you feel how do you deal with the feeling of being sort of overwhelmed um, in your studies? I mean, first of all, if you feel feel that way um, at times. Yeah, so um, burnout is something that I definitely get into probably once or twice a year, I would say. Um, and the reason why I'm coming to recognize this now myself is that I feel that I need to like do everything and I need to like finish everything. And so I push myself to like be here for an unreasonable amount of time so that I could get something done. But what I don't realize is that I'm actually being so exhausted, burning myself out essentially, that I'm starting to make mistakes and then I would do something that didn't work, but then it should have worked because I did something wrong. And so 
also realizing that also makes me burn out a little too. Um, and that happens a lot um, when I'm not taking care of myself. So this year, like I'm striving to do that. So <laughs> well, hopefully it's a little better. But um, what's really helpful is that I have a lot of lab mates who also understand what's going on. They understand like the pressure and like understand like how I'm feeling about like wanting to like get things right and perfect and all that stuff and that's like really is not good for burnout but what's really great is actually on campus we have a really supportive um department as well we have uh help on campus is available if you ever feel stressed out or burned out there is um, people that you can talk to and I found that like those have been really helpful as well so I would say like if you're burning out um it's it might happen. Like I would say like a lot of the students here definitely experience that. And I would say that that usually happens to me somewhere around like winter semester, I think like is when it like hits, like, cause like when fall happens, you're like, okay, new year, you're going to do great this year. Um, and then somewhere around winter, you kind of like lose track and lose sight of the goal in mind. Um, but just be kind to yourself. Remember that you're a human being, like you need to eat, you need to sleep so that you can function properly. That'll help you from preventing yourself from going down that way right yes and i think it's um it's a fairly common experience from what i also hear as well um, among graduate students you know they work very very hard right you all do work very very hard but that also you know comes with you know sort of tendency to be a, a perfectionist and, and try to do everything like just exactly like how you describe um so what about you molly do you do you feel burnout out sometimes and how do you sort of um yes um deal with that sort of situation when that happens me yes okay sorry. if you don't mind yes no i don't mind um yeah a lot of this sounds familiar like you speaking about burnout and wanting to do things perfectly for sure how do i deal with it i really don't feel qualified <laughs> to answer this question i'm still learning how to deal with it one really important simple thing was take weekends off i probably didn't do that for like a year <laughs> it was way too long not to take a weekend off like it's okay to close your laptop especially during covid because we work right by our Ouch. So I feel like I should always be working. So it's okay to take weekends off, small things like that. Um, the people who are around you can be a big help. This has again been hard during COVID. We're not allowed to be around people, but if you're able to, you know, go do things that you love, that's really important. And then you come back kind of refreshed. I think Molly was thinking about like kind of making mistakes that because you're so exhausted. So I found those two things really important. And also just remembering that like the requirements of academia and the, the, the doctorate degree or your master's, they're they're very challenging and they're actually not accessible to a lot of bodies and a lot of minds. So don't, it's easy to like, feel like it's your individual problem, but actually like, why couldn't it be an eight year degree? Why does it have to be a four year degree? And like, <laughs> there are, like if you're TAing, I really, I, I'm in disability studies and I was just in a webinar from our union talking about the duty, the duty to accommodate and all of the different accommodations that York will provide us with. Like that's so important to know. Um, to actually just make it hopefully more accessible for you if you're teeing um, as a student, um, whatever. So um, I'm still learning though, <laughs> but weekends off was probably a big help. <laughs> Yeah, great. No, thank you. And then that's true. And I think especially since COVID, you know, I guess, you know, people, of course, uh, respond to it and had experienced, you know, differently during the COVID and shutdowns. And I think, you know, more that you are uh, back on campus, some students are still mostly working remotely um, as well. So I think, you know, just the, you know, sort of the importance for reminding yourself, taking care of yourself, uh, taking time off and all of that, you know, that's really important. So thanks for uh, mentioning that. Um, from my end, I would just mention a little bit about, because I think some you know um, questions have um uh, we received some questions on sort of the support system that the university has. Um, so I just mentioned that from the university side that, you know, it's been really recognized that the mental health of graduate students is especially, but, you know, really all post-secondary um, um, university students as well uh, has becoming a more of a, you know, um, priority in our sort of, you know, preparing for our support system as well. So for example, at the Faculty of Graduate Studies at York University, so now we have uh, sort of a counseling team. I think we will call it a grad wellness uh, team 
team, and one of um, them is a counselor who provides a full time reading support, specifically with the graduate students. The university also has accessibility services and the counselors there as well. Uh, but because of the really the large number of undergraduate students, they tend to be more specialized in supporting undergraduate students, although I mean that a support is open to all students, but um, recognizing that the graduate students tend to have also a specific um, you know, uh, needs that, that we also have in-house counselor uh, supporting and meeting with students um, you know, who are experiencing sort of any sort of issues as well. Uh, so that's available. Um, of course, the university also try you know, our best, of course, and do it to accommodate and think that you mentioned, Molly, um, to be able to accommodate students with different needs and might be going through sort of a temporally you know, difficulty. Um, so we do have, the university has sort of a systems to be able to, um, for the students to be able to take a leave when they need, uh, when, when it's, um, you know, uh, when it's necessary. Also with the QP, um, you know, the teaching assistants who have funding and teaching assessment, um, assignments, there are certain sort of support available to um, um, students as well, who are also QP members, which is most of the PhD students and some of the uh, master's students as well. Um, so these things, we have more information available uh, on our website. So I just want to, to mention that, that, that that's the case. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, do you mind if I just jump in just a second? Go ahead, on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I have depression and have struggled with, you know, very intense bouts of, of really overworking myself and having, you know, intense burnout and depressive episodes where like for a month or two, I'm just not able to do anything. Um, and that for me was especially bad over my masters um, because both the workload is so much more intense and the deadlines sort of feel more um, sort of all consuming. Um, and so one of the things that I do want to highlight is that with, with TA ships and, or, or GA ships with, with, our, with our union, um, with our benefits, we at 3000 a year for paramedical and, and 2000 for any one service. So, you know, it's, up, you're able to have, you know, $2,000 a year for just therapy. And so for me, I found that like, I started therapy when I began my PhD, that I was, I, that I realized was something that I needed to do to be able to actually figure out how to kind of cultivate a level of mindfulness around my own needs and, and how to kind of set clear limits on how much of my life academia takes up. Because one of the things <clears throat> that I think can be really easy is that we start to get into the trap of that is just the totality of everything we do, that every second is we need to be making more progress. I need to read another, there's more books that I need to read. I need to write more papers. I need to submit to conferences. I need to like, like it's a never ending list of, of deadlines and things that you could be doing or should be doing. And so I think one of the things that's been really important over the last two, three years for me has been figuring out how to treat academia, especially graduate school, as a have the ability to say, I will only spend five, six, seven hours working and then it's done. Like I am stopping, I'm gonna set a realistic goal of what I'll get done today, but I'm not going to get caught in that trap of, of doing research from the time I wake up until I like am too exhausted to function and need to just fall asleep. And that is, I think a really hard thing that that is really difficult to figure out how to kind of set those boundaries and recognize that it isn't something that should be all consuming in our lives. And thanks, Cameron, for sharing that, um, you know, sort of a personal story too. But um, yeah, so, you know, it's really the nice, sounds like all three of you sort of have similar or, you know, a common experience of, you know, experiencing, you know, difficulty at uh, some points in your graduate life. And it's good to know that all of you had some way of accessing support system um, as well, just finding a way, but it is, you know, as um, uh, Sammy, you mentioned, it's a continuous sort of journey as well. Um, okay, so next I'll move to sort of the, the, the resources questions. Um, and this is not related to, so just as sort of, um, uh, to provide context, a lot of the uh, doctoral students and, and research-based master's students at York University come with the uh, basic funding when they're offered admission. So it comes from, and I think all of you have uh, uh, entered the university as a funded student. But um, on top of the funding that was sort of guaranteed when you admitted to the program, if you can also mention any sort of scholarships and other resources that you sought and were able to receive um, to be able to sort of support you know, studies further. So that's again, in addition to the 
the basic funding. Um, so I'll ask this question to uh, Molly and Cameron. Uh, Molly, would you start? Um, hi. So um, some of the funding that we have for uh, our stipend is, so about 10,000 of it comes from a fellowship from your university. So I say like three, 4,000 comes from your RA ship from your professor. And then I would say that the rest comes from your TA ship. And so you have 1.0 TA credit per year. And then um, from there, like you, that's like makes up your package. I also say like on top of that, you also have a lot of opportunities like scholarships and everything that you can apply to. York itself offers a lot of, um, a lot of just like institutional scholarships, but on top of that, there's a lot of tri-council scholarships that are available as well. So those are really great to have. Yeah, thanks. And then Molly, did you um, personally apply for so anything other than the funding package, but like the tri-council, tri-council, by the way, for uh, the audience, I'll just mention that this, these are the yeah. federal granting uh, awards. So, yeah. you know, it categorizes mm -hmm. into the science and engineering field and health and social science and humanities. But mm -hmm. Molly, in your case, did you seek any uh, uh, scholarships? Yes, I did. So um, I seeked out uh, NSERC originally in my first year here, and I was actually successful. And from that, I was able to gain a, um, another scholarship that was under, it was called the Michael Smith uh, Foreign Study Supplement, which I was able to use to complete an internship in the US. Um, on top of that, I had a lot of institutional scholarships as well from the uh, York University. And uh, there's a lot of like amazing donors and everything. Um, and there's always like something out there. If you look through like the finance, the finance uh, assistance, uh, what's it called, the, the, the webpage, there's a lot of like um, opportunities there. They all have like different deadlines. So just like make sure you're aware of those and make sure like you know like what you need for all of those when you apply. Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks. Um, Cameron, I, I mean, I know what skills you, you have, but can you tell us uh, how you sort of, you know, what sort of opportunity do you saw and, and receive? Yeah, yeah. So I, when I applied for my master's, so in the, you know, the year before I started my master's, as I was applying for it, I also applied for the Shirk, um, the Shirk Canadian Graduate Scholarship, the master's level, the CGSM, um, which I think is something that often people don't realize they can apply to and should be trying to apply to as they're applying for grad for their master's. A lot of people will kind of come in September having entered having entered their degree, and then will realize that they can, you know, apply for the next year, but that they could have applied before for their first year. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind to like, keep that in mind that you can, you are eligible to apply for it if you're, you know, entering a master's program. Um, <clears throat> so I had that for my, so I applied for that and got that for my first year of my master's. I then applied for OGS, um, which is the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, um, which is, oh, so the master's, the CGSM is 17,500. Um, and then the OGS is 15,000 for one year. Um, and that's sort of a similar application process as the master's one, like a one page proposal um, and an academic CV. And I, I forget what the requirements are now. Um, and then uh, for my PhD, I uh, applied very early and had to check with Yuko that I was technically allowed to apply this early, but <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> I applied for the, the Vanier Canadian Graduate Scholarship, which is the, um, the top kind of tri-council scholarship. Um, and in that first year, so before I'd applied, I did not make it out of York. Um, and then uh, I did apply for OGS and got that in my first year. And, and ended up fourth. Um, and so that is... Uh, that's a 50,000 a year for three year scholarship, um, which is very competitive, but it requires kind of three rounds internally in York of submitting application materials, getting feedback, building on it kind of as they cut, cut um, nominees and then going to the national competition. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if it makes, if there's, if it's worth speaking to what things to, to keep in mind for applying for them or, just to leave it at that. 
Yeah, I think, you know, you can leave it that. And I can sort of yeah. describe a little bit. Um, and we also actually have, as a part of the experience grad studies week, um, we have a scholarship sessions as well. So I think the first one is tomorrow uh, morning. And then I think there's another, there's two more um, during the week. Um, so international and domestic students one. Um, so if you're interested in learning further about sort of additional uh, scholarship and funding opportunities, I'll be talking a bit more about those as well. But I think Cameron, like, I think it's a really good point that, um, that some students apply and then apply again and then are successful second time or third time around um, and there are also various you know opportunities as well and I would think that not everyone is successful in every competition but um, you know if you seek um, out opportunities and they're typically something that would um, be uh, that will work uh, for you as well so again so we'll be talking a bit more about that specific scholarship session tomorrow so I encourage the um, you and the audience to attend if you're interested so thanks uh, for sharing that um, both of you. Okay, um, so uh, next is a little bit about um, also TA ship, sorry, about the question on TA ship is what I wanted to next ask next. Um, Sami, if you can describe, I believe probably most doctoral students are when they are admitted, they, they have sort of package come with a sort of a TA assignment that most students uh, take uh, while they uh, study as well. Um, Muli, can you, uh, sorry, Sami, so Sami, can you describe um, sort of the overall time commitment of teaching per week and sort of how you balance and whether you're teaching at all is related to your uh, research or not? Sure. Um, I think the it's a little bit different for... Okay, so I, I did a half TA ship both times, like two, over two semesters, I did a half and a half. <laughs> Um, so I was doing 10 hours a term, 10 hours a week over the semester. And I think if you have a 1.0, it would just be double that. So 20 hours a week over the semester, if I am correct. <laughs> um, so mine was 10 hours a week. And I found that that was pretty manageable as long as you're strict about not going over your hours. Like <laughs> the relationship between professor and TA could like, it could easily be that you're, you're doing, you're giving way more of your time. So um, I would say be mindful and remember that like, you know, this is the collective agreement. These are your rights. If you're doing extra work, go to your union. You know, you can um, you can get extra pay or whatever it says in the collective agreement. Um, and for me, I was TAing in the Faculty of Health. So my studies is I wouldn't say it's really health related. <laughs> it's um, more like uh, sociology or critical theory. Um, but there are lots of programs in the Faculty of Health. So some of it, like we were doing an introduction to sociological thinking about health. So a lot of that course was um, was really interesting to me and it was applicable. And you can always, what I've kind of seen is like switch it up. If you, It's been nice, I TA the same course twice. So it was really nice because I already knew the material. I didn't have to prep as much the second time around, but also um, I've had other friends who they did not like teaching that one course. So they switched to another course. So. Um, and I've heard from various professors at seeing just again, just to be mindful how much work work it takes up for you, and um, to think about what kind of what you want from the future. Do you want to teach? How much teaching experience will actually help you on your CV versus other experiences? These are all important questions that I've been asking myself. Thank you. And um, Molly and Cameron, do you also teach as well? You do. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I think that's a fairly a common experience for most doctoral level students. For master's students, it's not always the case. Um, some do, and then um, most others don't. And I also want to mention, I think, Molly, when you're talking about the funding, you're talking about the research assistantship, the RA ship. So RA ship is something that also is fairly uh, common in certain disciplines, usually science and engineering, it's fairly common. And then others, it's sort of, you know, if you have a supervisor who has a project that you know you want to work on, and if your research is related to that field, then you want to be on the project and so forth. So yeah, so the uh, teaching assistantship, again, is fairly common for more most uh, full-time doctoral students and the research assistantship, the RRship is a uh, little bit uh, depending on the, your uh, discipline area as well. But those are the kind of typical experience that the graduate students um, have at York. Okay, so the next um, sort of um, question is if you can talk a little bit about sort of the aspects of social life as a graduate student. Um, so the first question is, um, like, how do you keep a social life as a graduate student, especially uh, during uh, COVID? And, you know, social life that could be really not related to your um, grad work as well, or it could be at the university, but not related to your academic um, life. So, uh, Molly, um, can you mention a little bit about sort of the social life and sort of balancing the grad uh, work? Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, while I uh, started here, um, I actually participated in a few different things. Um, I was on the exec team for the Chemistry Graduate Student Association, and I helped them plan events. So for a few years, we were doing like uh, holiday dinners at the end of the year where like we'd all come together and like play games and also just like have some food. And it was really lovely. Unfortunately, with COVID, like we weren't able to do that over the past like year and probably not this year either, unfortunately. But it was an absolutely lovely experience. And it was really great because like our community, our like chemistry community is like relatively like decently small size. So you get to know everyone really well. You really get to like befriend everyone and just like learn about their research. So it's super duper cool. And I think it's really conducive to like my learning as like a chemist as well. Um, on top of that, I also got involved in a few other things. So um, I sat on the tenure and promotions committee for uh, two years as well. Um, and it was really cool because uh, one of the things that I wanted to do when I first joined grad school was I wanted to eventually potentially like become a professor like Cameron had uh, talked about earlier. Um, it was like a career path that I was thinking about. So seeing the other side of how everything works and comes together, that was like really awesome. In terms of social life, um, I would say this is like the best advice I've ever gotten from someone. It was keep your like grad friends, but you also need friends who aren't in grad school, like friends that are just like living their life and like out there. Because I feel like a lot of times um, in grad school, like a lot of us will just get together and go like, oh, my experiment didn't work. My experiment also didn't work. And then we start talking about things not working. And it's like, hey, like what else is happening, you know? So it's really nice to have friends that are outside of grad school who like also have different life experiences and just like catching up with them. Like that's really great. And um, I would say also like I personally enjoy volunteering. And one of the things that I did while I was still in grad school was um, I was a part of a committee in um, Peterborough actually. There's a zoo there and they do like fundraisers every summer. So like I help up with that because like I just like to. And like it's really great for me to just like take my mind off of school a little bit and then like do something else that I'm really interested and passionate about and just give myself some like room and space to breathe because sometimes I'm like okay this is not working I'll come back to it another day passes I'm like oh my goodness this is exactly what I need to do this is why it didn't work and then it'll work perfectly fine so like that's like really helpful <laughs> okay great yeah um what about you Sammy do you um have uh, something you can share in terms of like a social life um either as a grad student or any anywhere else um, sure. Uh, I am doing a couple of things with the CDS program. We have a Deaf, Hard of Hearing Allies Caucus that we just started and we're doing a seminar series. We've done once one presenter already, so that's been something that's been a lot of work. Uh, but I think um, kind of to echo what Molly said, to have friends off of campus is important and also um, like reminding yourself, this goes back to like the feeling burnt out that doing your other hobbies that aren't your research that aren't reading your textbook are actually so important and it's okay to to do that so for me it's weightlifting and I'm competing at provincials next month and that's okay I can go to the training and that's good so that's been a that's been a lifesaver for me is going to the gym <laughs> okay great um yeah, um, okay, so, and then I think the next question is around sort of the you know, life in Toronto. I don't, do all of you live in Toronto currently? Um, okay, good. Um, so this question about sort of the, how is the local area housing food transportation on campus? Um, I don't know if any of you live or close to campus or around um, Toronto, um, but okay, so this first of all, not living perhaps, but on campus, um, I guess Molly, maybe you are probably more on campus than, uh, the other two. Can you describe sort of what um what's available on campus? Basically? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um I'm I used to live on campus actually for two years. Um so I would say that there's lots of varieties of options that's available. So uh, if you're interested in on campus housing, look at your housing, your university housing. There's like lots of different options. There's like apartment style, suite style, or like two bedroom, one bedroom, like you name it. Um there's also like suites that are designed for like families. So those that are like mature students who have families are able to live on campus. It's really great to live on campus because like um, you're like 10 minutes away from your research. It's also terrible because you're like, it's just 10 minutes away from your research. You can do this at 2 a.m. So this is what you start telling yourself. So it's like a plus and a minus in some ways. Um, on top of that, we also have the quad as well. It's also another type of student residence. It's like 
super duper expensive but it's like super nice so like you know like if you can afford it like kudos to you if you can't um like there's lots of options that are really affordable in terms of like toronto living because like if you're not from toronto it's like a shocker when you come here and the rent is like two thousand dollars a month and you're like okay this is like barely like this is crazy like living expenses but on campus housing is really affordable, I say. Um, last time that I was looking at it, it was like I think like a thousand dollars a month for like your own like room, like your own like suite in a one bedroom. And if you wanted to, you could do like a two bedroom, I think, and then it's like your cost would even go down even more. So like definitely something to look into if you are looking to be a grad student here. Okay, thank you. And does anyone else want to add to what Molly mentioned around sort of things available on campus around? No? Okay. Okay, so um, I'll move to the next question um, about research. Okay, so and that again, I would just say that it might also be a bit discipline specific, but how in independent is the research of the student? Do students work together or end with the supervisor? Or do you do research mostly like so what is kind of your relationship with your uh, supervisor? I would like to start with Cameron here. Um, so for me, it's fairly leans fairly sort of heavily towards in more independent. Um, <coughs> there's, you know, there's obviously working with my supervisor in terms of, you know, like preparing my proposal and her giving me feedback and suggesting how I how I might have, you know, what questions should I be asking? What, should I, how should I approach the research? But like the actual research itself will be something that I'll be, you know, for anthropology, you do field work. So you go off on your own, you do your thing for several months to a year, and then you come back. Uh, and so that'll be very like just me um, alone doing it, not really doing it with her. <laughs> um, but um, there are other things where, you know, uh, like research groups or reading groups or working on publications and conference, you know, panels, which are more collaborative and more kind of like working on things together and creating something um, alongside my supervisor. Um, and so it, it's really kind of, yeah, it's kind of a mix, but generally I think for skews more um, on that kind of independent side, which I think is sort of more typical of the kind of like the humanities and social science. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and what about you, Molly? I guess given that you're in chemistry and working in labs, maybe the relationship might be a little bit different. Will you describe your sort of how you do your research in relation to your supervisor or the lab you know, uh, colleagues? Yeah, definitely. So um, what I was really nervous about when I first started grad school was like, I barely know anything and now I'm here expected like change the world and I'm like I'm not ready so like I'm really glad because my supervisor is really great at this where like at the very beginning he's kind of guiding your thoughts and like telling you okay this is what would happen this is some of the things that I want to do and then it's like gets to a point where you start to have a little bit more independence because now you're more sure of your abilities you're more sure of like what you can do so that when your professor says this is what I want done you're ready to go like, okay, cool. I can figure out ways to get that done. And then eventually it starts moving towards the, okay, your project is this overarching idea. Now think of little things and like little different, like interesting perspectives that you could take on this project. And now you're coming up with your own ideas. So I would say like you have independence. It's just that it's a growth into it that like, you're not like thrown into the pool, like the deep end of it just, told to swim like that's not what happened between myself and my supervisor I'm super grateful for that because I think that I would not be here the same person that I am today in terms of like the researcher if I didn't have that kind of like a growing opportunity so um I would say that that would be what that kind of relationship looks like like every lab also is different like some professors are very hands-on some professors are very hands-off so when I first joined a lab um what was important to me was talking to the students themselves so like I like emailed the students like after I discussed with like the professor like about research and everything and then just like asked them what their perspective was in terms of the professor because I knew that myself like I'm more of like a hands-off person I'm just like just tell me and then I will go do it so um just finding that match is really important when you're looking at grad school finding someone that works really well with you that you think that you can spend like six years with <laughs> that's what's really important <laughs> 
Right, right. And so, yeah, so you have, in, in your case, so you, would you say you do most of then your um, research in the lab, like physical in the lab? Yeah, yeah. So everything for me is like physically in the lab because I have to like make things. So I have to be here. Right, right. So yeah, so I guess that would have been very different during the COVID time. But um, so yeah, oh, yeah. Um, good that now you're able to be in the lab again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> right, right. Good. So yeah, so these things sort of, you know, also, yeah, depend on the discipline. And generally, again, the Faculty of Science or the Chemistry, Biology program tend to be more lab work based, uh, working um, with supervisors, perhaps as a research assistant on their project. And so you have your research project related to that. Whereas like someone like I think Cameron, you have, you had your own idea of what you wanted to research on the research topic and then supervise the support um, through your journey, right? So yeah, it's interesting to know um, that, um, that these different um, experiences happen. Um, there is an, a question from the audience about um, uh, someone who is thinking, who currently works full time, and I think for all of you sort of said that there was a gap between, you know, undergrad and grad, a grad and doctoral, um, but uh, so this person, so uh, they work full time currently and then planning to work full time and then could, uh, and start their master's. And I know York University has uh, quite a few master's and doctoral students, but more master's students on a part time basis. But would you describe sort of how hard um, or how, what the difference is between the master's level courses and undergraduate uh, level courses? Um, what would you say are sort of the main difference in terms of the demanding, you know, the level or the expectations or just the actual, I guess, time uh, that it takes. I um, can ask that question to Molly. Um, sorry, this one no more if I keep, yeah. so Sammy is what I want. I was looking at Sammy and I'm sorry, like somehow I didn't have the right name. Um, but yeah, Sammy, would you describe sort of the difference between undergraduate and graduate level courses? Uh, sure, so I'm coming from the arts to another arts program. Like, well, I guess I'm in the faculty of health, but mm, critical disability studies is like lots of reading and writing. So I would say that's the, the biggest difference is you're probably gonna read more every week and your assignments will probably be bigger. But what I found is that it's a lot less small little things. So you, you have a lot more control or you can kind of self-direct yourself. You can, it's more self-directed, okay? That's what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I, in my first year of my doctorate, I was, in my PhD, I was uh, working full, well, I was working part-time. I went down from five days a week to three days a week and um, it was manageable. So if you're gonna be working full-time, I'm not sure if you're gonna be studying part-time, but um, definitely manageable um, and like, it, sometimes it has to be done. And I think an important thing too, like maybe this was something you did in your undergrad, but making sure that professors know that. And I think a lot of professors kind of realized maybe during COVID that classes can, can be made more accessible to students and assignments can be made more accessible, like um, timelines and, and other things like that. So I, yeah, I guess I would just say the reading and the writing is probably gonna be a lot more, but like in terms of maybe participation or smaller, um, more frequent assignments, I found that that wasn't as, I didn't see those as often in my master's. Um, Cameron, what would you say um, between sort of undergrad and graduate, um, you know, courses difference, um, also any sort of activities that are, you know, quite different as a graduate student that was not the case in undergrad? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, I'd say like a graduate level course, the equivalent of like, two maybe three undergrad courses because there's a lot more reading generally like in the you know the humanities <coughs> um and social sciences there's a lot more reading and there's also an, a much firmer expectation that you will do it like in undergrad you know you're going to be often you're in like 100 200 600 student classes there's reading assigning assigned but like you're not having a conversation about it um but in graduate courses, it is at the very most, maybe 20 people, usually 10 or less. And so it is three hours where you are having a conversation about the readings. Like <clears throat> it is not a, a professor lecturing to you and like sometimes asking questions. It is, you need to be, the expectations are that you have, are able to carry on an in-depth conversation about like, you know, with critical insights into the the readings. And so there is just sort of that different kind of, there's less flexibility, I think, in terms of the time commitment that has to go into preparing for like for, for courses. 
um, because there's just that expectation that you're kind of, because it, it, it like graduate studies at the master level, but especially the PhD level, you are in this transition from student to professional. Like you are in this transition stage from like undergraduate student to professor, right? And graduate studies is this kind of like training period. So those expectations are that you're kind of moving towards that, that, that there is that kind of like greater, like you are supposed to be kind of more like you, yeah, there's just sort of that more expectation there. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I would add that, yes, as I mentioned that, you know, the students, a lot of the full-time students, um, you know, whether, you know, be in Toronto and, you know, the, um, the you know, circumstances, um, you know, a, a lot of them do work um, while, you know, and then they, a lot of them work as TA, but also some work um, out of the TA chip as well, um, but also um, some students actually uh, study part-time as well. So it's sort of, you know, it's up to you sort of, you know, decisions around the funding availability, the personal circumstances, what a need are for employment. But it is good to know, like, as you know, uh, Sami mentioned that it is doable in some way uh, to do study and work, but the, you know, the demand is, you know, quite um, strong, but also, you know, in some way, um, it's probably common that grad work is a big component and not so small. So then you probably have to organize um, your life around that. Um, I have a couple more questions. This one I think will be um, Molly. I will ask. Um, and uh, the university, you know, um, generally, of course, we want there are initiatives that are happening to be more inclusive of you know students with different backgrounds, abilities, and sort of experiences. And you know, your university um, self also is working towards. But how do you sort of feel as a student and as a student of a minority background? Do you feel included, and do you see that with probably you know other uh, students' experiences as well at York? Um, um, would you be able to talk a little bit about that? in terms yeah. of home, sense of belonging, sense of being home. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel that there's a lot of initiatives being put forward by the university itself to in create a very inclusive environment. Um, there is, I, I can only speak about it from like my perspective. Um, I personally feel that some of the biggest things that came from, um, for instance, like the Black Lives Matter um, movement, one of the biggest things that I heard even my, like my supervisor and other people in the department talking about was the fact that like our department at the time was realizing that they did not have a lot of minority representation. And so moving forward, they said, we really need to consider this as something that's important to our students and to make it a more inclusive environment. And they've actively um, incorporated that into um, their search for applicants in the future. On top of that, I know that there's also been a movement towards creating an inclusivity committee. I believe it's either on Senate or it's on, I'm not super sure which one, but I think it's on Senate, but they were creating a committee so that they could look at the policies and the things that um, your has put forward previously, just to make sure that we are creating that environment that's inclusive for students. Um, from my end as like a TA, I've met students from many different backgrounds and I've met students who have had for instance, um, disabilities or um, anything like that. And I feel that they've always had a really great, um, they've always had a lot of opportunity to go to the accessibility office, which we have um, a really great support system. We have OSCAR, which is the Office of Student Community Relations, and they're really great at advocating for students who do have needs. And so um, I've always like directed my students to them and they've always been able to take care of them really well. So I do say like, um, I think that York in itself is working towards creating that very at home environment and making sure that students needs and also different backgrounds are being considered. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. And I know this uh, was a little bit related Sammy, um, Sammy, like your research is about, you know, sort of challenging, you know, the existing sort of, you know, the structure and in systemic issues. Uh, do you have something to add about that? So being a graduate student at York and researching specifically in the critical disabilities program, um, would you be able to sort of add your perspective on, on this topic as well? Um, sure. Um, right now, I'm kind of focusing on a lot, a lot of what I'm doing, my, my um, both research and then also just like other activities at York, uh, a GA ship and um, this caucus I, I mentioned earlier is uh, trying to address 
the hearing centric structure of the university and the exclusion of deaf and hard of hearing students, faculty, administrators from York. Um, and it's like, I think critical disability studies pro probably and other perhaps like critical theory fields. <laughs> it can sometimes be a tension or a conflict because we're trying to create a space that is maybe different from like rehab services, like quite different um, ideas around disability and what needs to change, you know, not the body, but the social structures. Um, so there's a lot of tension and it, and it makes it hard to, um, to, <laughs> to do your studies. Um, but we're at the CDS program, while we don't have a deaf professor is in the process of, you know, changing these things. And the faculty are so open. And so like, this is what they do. They're critical display studies professors. They want it to be better and they want the university to be more inclusive, more accessible, you know, um, not so much gaps between community and the academy. So um, while it's disheartening to <laughs> think about um, how the university is uh, exclusive and then uh, me, myself as a hearing individual, particularly uh, in this instance, uh, the privilege um, in which we navigate university is like auditorily or linguistically accessible. But um, on the plus, my program has been so supportive of like what our caucus is trying to set up, a seminar series, you know, trying to create better representation and hiring. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. You know, you you really honest views. I um, mean, of course, you know, I myself also recognize, you know, in a way that I work with the students, you know, I'm limited to doing certain things. And so, you know, it's a really an ongoing process for the university the staff as well. And of course, everyone in the community as well. But thank you for uh, sharing that perspective. Um, and we're coming, um, so the time is going very fast. We have about 15 minutes. So I have a question um, to, um, to, I guess I'll ask this to Cameron, but what do you wish um, you knew um, before you begin your studies? Like any surprises at the graduate level, the things that you did not expect that you thought um, would have been better if you knew coming into the program? Um. Actually, that's a hard one to, to answer. I think, <laughs> I think, I'm not sure that's actually kind of like, a, I think that's a hard question to answer. Because um, I think for me, I <clears throat> was very, meth I was very methodical about doing graduate school. So I was really, um, I tried to go in, into both like with the master's deciding to do it, it because I had a very I had very clear ideas about like the research I wanted to do and I really wanted to do this and I was very like clear of like this is why I'm doing it um, and I think with the doctorate I think I think one of the things that I sort of, or I maybe like was aware of going into it and have only kind of become more aware of or really kind of internalized more is that <clears throat> um, as much as, you know, for mo most, many of us who are going into doctoral studies, the dream or the goal is to become a professor, right? Like you, most people entering a PhD are hoping to end up being an, in an academic career. Um, but I think knowing how difficult that is to actually get to the end of your PhD and, and actually, you know, be hired as a professor. Um, I think the things that I've been trying to keep aware of, and I think have, have come to understand more, is both being able to kind of see the PhD as potentially a discrete experience itself that may not lead to that, um, and that it isn't a failure if it doesn't, right? Like it may be that the end of the PhD, just like that may be the end of being in academia. And that is not indicative of like a larger failing to, you know, not get one of those, you know, 13 jobs that are posted in the year where hundreds of people are applying, right? Like <clears throat> having that understanding that it is not indicative of, of, a, of you know, like our abilities. Um, but I think also then being really, thoughtful about if the goal is to end up in an academic career at the end of the PhD, then the work to start to prepare for it begins like right away. Like that's starting to get a sense of like, you know, how long, how long it takes to publish, you know, 
that building connections and networks, you know, all of those things take years. And so you can't get to your fifth or sixth year and say, okay, now I need to like publish things and get my name out and start to build a profile and like an academic CV that's going to be, you know, considered, right? I think that question of like going into a PhD, both with very clear eyes about how difficult it is to end up with an academic career afterwards and being kind of very aware of the kind of work that needs to be done throughout the whole thing. Um, yeah, is I think something that I was kind of aware of, but have only kind of continued to, to better understand as I've gone along. That's a good point, yes. And then in a PhD program, especially, is a fairly long journey on its own, but also it is a journey to the, you know, the next uh, phase of, you know, of course, your, your life as well. So uh, that's a really, really good point. Um, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, and related to that, I think we'll get to the, the last question, which is really any advice that you might have for uh, students who are considering or the individuals are considering to apply uh, for graduate school. Um, maybe uh, Cameron, since you sort of had a related um, question, would you like to start um, on any advice for prospective students? Sure. I think um, one thing I'll say is I think it, you want to start earlier than you maybe expect or think. Um, like especially, like I started in the fall and for my master's, and I think over the summer before applying for my for my doctorate. Um, in part because the you know just to actually build up a really strong application takes time. Um, but also, <clears throat> I found that, especially at the doctorate level, you want to be reaching out and talking to professors before applying because you want to have a rapport. You want to see that you have people that they're going to be interested in your work, that you kind of connect with them. Um, but one of the things that's come for it with me is because I applied to a number of schools is that I have a number of people at different universities that I have a relationship with even though I haven't ended up there, going through the application process, talking to them, having conversations has meant that I kind of know people that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten to know yet. Um, so I think that's one thing to, the, one piece of advice. I think the other thing that I would say is, <clears throat> um, you know, the like, your application and, and process into graduate school is not, everyone's process looks kind of different and, <laughs> Like I failed two courses in my undergrad and got a number of C's, C pluses. Um, like my transcript was not great, um, <clears throat> but um, I, I think in kind of taking graduate school seriously, like wanting to apply and taking time off and kind of, you know, sub, up, like publishing in student journals and like getting to know professors and kind of really being really careful or thoughtful about my application that meant I had other strengths that I could kind of point to that balanced out things. So I think recognizing that like a less than stellar transcript is not like a nail in the coffin about applying to graduate school. Um, and I think you can bring different strengths and, and highlight different things um, and that admissions committees are usually looking more holistically. Um, and so you can highlight really the things that you bring um, and, and still have traction there. Yeah. Great. That, that's great to know. And I hope that really is the case that I, 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 you know, from sort of my perspective as well, the university recognizing that the transcripts and sort of the formal student records are not necessarily reflective of the student's research potential and academic abilities uh, as a graduate student. Um, so, you know, we also do put in some work, you know, for the admissions, scholarship applications to be able to be more inclusive and be able to assess the student's abilities and potential again um, from a variety of, you know, different uh, sources and information. So it's great to know that for you, Cameron, that it has worked out and your experience has, has been sort of reflective of that. Um, so that's great. Um, thank you. Uh, Molly, can I ask you next the advice for um, prospective students? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the biggest thing I would say is definitely look for research that really interests you because you're going to be doing it for many years, possibly like even more than you think. Um, so look for something that really interests you and make sure you talk to professors, talk to the students most of all. You wanna make sure that that environment that the students are in is an environment that you think you'll be able to thrive and grow because that's really important um, a part of grad school. I would also say just don't be discouraged. Just keep trying. Like do what you do what you think that you would feel happy doing. Like don't 
feel discouraged in part of the process I know it's like it's like a lot to do it is a lot to like consider and there's a lot going on so just remember that like this is like a marathon not a race like you'll get there and yeah I just wish you all best of luck you're gonna do great thank you um uh last but not least um Sammy uh, advice to prospective students sure what great advice already um <laughs> Yeah, I wish I knew some of this before I applied. Uh, definitely the like, it's a marathon, like, and I'm still learning to just to be kind to yourself. And we're constantly trying to do more and publish more and compete against each other for this scholarship. And <laughs> it's not always the friendliest space to be in. So yeah, definitely be kind to yourself and also surround yourself if you can with people who support you and animals that support you. <laughs> It, both in academia and outside. So um, I'm just now really, really leaning on like my supervisor and my professor as I'm like re-examining my own position and what am I studying? And uh, you might know what you wanted to do from the start and you might figure it out later. I think it's different for everybody. Um, but if, if there's people around you, you can turn to, that's really important, especially I'm finding during COVID as my program is like, we're still from home. Um, there are people at school that are going to support you and like molly said you can do this just you know be be gentle with yourself you might be rejected from scholarships like we've said your your transcript might not be that great but um there's hope like you got this <laughs> yeah okay thank you um any sort of last final words that you haven't shared that you wanted to share with the audience before we close um, okay, so um, so these were all the questions, and thank you again for the panelists.